Susan Wolf takes a much more holistic approach to the topic of freedom and moral responsibility than the metaphysicians such as myself who are interested in this topic. I'm taking this presentation primarily from her book called Freedom Within Reason. And I'm especially focusing on, on the chapter where she develops what she calls the reason view. So let's make sure we're clear on what the view is. Wolf says that one is a morally responsible agent if and only if one has the ability to act according to reason. That's reason with a capital R that's intentional. And that is one has a, the ability to act in accordance with the true, capital T, and the good, capital G. So you have to have true beliefs and you have to have a, an awareness, a moral awareness of what is good. And so Wolf describes reason as and here's the quotation that we'll include, since it's so central to her view, it is the highest faculty or set of faculties there is, the faculty or set of faculties that in most circumstances will help us form true beliefs and good values. So the uh, capacity for reason, right, this reason, capital R, that is the key to being morally responsible. And presumably, of course, lower animals don't have this. So uh, lower functioning animals would never be held morally responsible. When you act in accordance with reason, it involves two different things, right? First of all, it involves that ability to know the true and the good, that the reason part has to have the capacity to understand, to believe accurately, to know the true and the good. But you also do have to have this more metaphysical capacity, an ability of execution. That is an ability to act according to what's known to be true and what's known to be good. So you have to have both of these things, when you act according to reason, you have to know what is true and, and good, and you have to be able to act according, accordingly. And Wolf argues that both of these abilities are necessary for moral responsibility, and they're together jointly sufficient for having moral responsibility. So uh, another way you could say that then is an agent is morally responsible if and only if the agent can do the right thing because of the right reasons. And so that's the central theme, the overall view that she is proposing. Now, some implications of the view that make it somewhat unique besides what we've already mentioned. One is that the reason view is asymmetrical. So she's fully aware of this, of course, and acknowledges this and makes it explicit. One may be determined to do good actions and deserve praise. So in that sense, she's in the compatibilist camp, right? One can be determined to do a good action and still be morally responsible, still deserve praise. But if one is determined to do bad actions, one does not deserve blame. In that case, the being determined, forced, so to speak, to do something wrong or bad, then you are not blameworthy. You are not morally responsible. Now, of course, metaphysically, each case involves the same amount of control. In both cases, you are determined to do something. So uh, that's asymmetrical. So wh what is her rationale for this? Just briefly consider the claim, um, he couldn't help but hit the child. Maybe somebody's driving an, uh, a car and the, a, a child runs out from uh, behind a bush and just runs straight into traffic and somebody hits the child. A, a tragedy, of course, but if that's what happened, the driver was not in control, had no 
capacity to not hit the child. And so we don't blame the driver. Or maybe somebody who's carrying an expensive vase and they have post-traumatic stress disorder and they're carrying it and then someone slams a door nearby with a really loud noise, the person jumps and drops the vase, we might say he had no choice but to, to break the vase, right? It wasn't within his control. So in those cases, because they were determined to do the action, they are not blameworthy. Now, on the other hand, on the positive side of things, consider somebody who tells the truth, who has such good character, they are like George Washington and cannot tell a lie. Well, we praise such character. We praise such individuals for telling the truth. Or suppose somebody is so compassionate and kind-hearted, and uh, we see that she's helping someone out who uh, needs assistance. And we say something like, she couldn't help but help the stranger, right? And Wolf takes these phrases seriously and says, even if that's true, right? If she had no alternative but to help the stranger, it's still morally praiseworthy to help the stranger. Okay, so that's what it is. What is it not, right? It helps to clarify her views and she's taking a fairly unique view by contrasting it with other views. Now in part two, I'm going to have to say much more about this, but uh, let's just stick with this idea. While ought implies can, so she does accept that, moral responsibility as a whole does not imply the ato, that is the ability to do otherwise, that I'm abbreviating ato, the ability to do otherwise. And Wolf, in fact, argues that having the ability to do otherwise is both unnecessary for moral responsibility. So we saw that with the previous examples just mentioned, like the woman who couldn't help but help the stranger. So it's not needed and it's actually undesirable. So in the case of somebody who cannot tell a lie, we don't want them to have the ability to tell the lie, right? We, we want such character firmly formed that they speak truth and we can rely on the individual. Now, uh, the, these two cases, consider uh, two different cases, all right? Same scenario, two different people. Somebody, a, a child is drowning in a lake or in the ocean, somebody's walking by, and in one case, the person walking by had this ability to refrain. So they see the drowning child, they think to themselves, I have a really nice clothes on, I don't wanna get them wet, wet, I'm late for a meeting, those kinds of thoughts, they consider just going on and acting like they never saw the child uh, drowning. And they had the ability to either go on to their meeting and keep their clothes dry or go ahead and jump in and save the child. Or you have another person, same scenario, but they see the drowning child and it's just right away, immediately, they jump in, uh, their thoughts are positive, poor child needs assistance, I'm here, I'm helping. Now, she says, obviously, we wouldn't want to be like the first person, right? The preference would be for us to be like the latter person who just doesn't even consider trying to make the meeting on time or uh, keeping their clothes dry. That's not an issue, right? And that's a value for the, the second person to just jump in, do the right thing immediately. So both individuals act according to reason, right? We imagine the first case, they do decide to jump in and save the child. They both act according to reason. And, but Wolf claims that both are equally praiseworthy, even though the second person didn't have the ability to do otherwise. So she concludes that having autonomy is her word for implying the ability to do otherwise, she concludes that it's not necessary for moral responsibility. And that's her defense of A, that the ability to do otherwise is unnecessary for moral responsibility. Again, we'll say much more about this in part two when we look at some criticisms. 
All right, the second aspect that it's not like, right? What is it in contrast to uh, the autonomy view is what she identifies or labels this view that she's contrasting it with. And the autonomy view is supposed to be some kind of libertarian view such as Keynes. We'll see again in part two, we'll explain much more why, why it's certainly not Keynes, but uh, that seems to be her target, the classic libertarian view. And Wolf claims that the autonomy view requires that one always have the ability to do otherwise. And those are the only concerns in the autonomy view. It's all about the metaphysics. And if you have the ability to do otherwise, she seems to say, then you are morally responsible. That's uh, something that obviously she rejected. The reason view does require the ability to do otherwise, except in the cases where someone does the right thing for the right reason. So if somebody's doing something bad and they are blameworthy, well, in that case, they do need to have the ability to do otherwise. They needed to have the ability to do what is good, what is acting according to the true and the good, right? And so they have to have that ability to do something else. But in cases when you do the right thing for the right reasons, you don't have to have the ability to do otherwise. All right. The second, uh, what it's not, right? Wolf distances her view from a hierarchical view, uh, what she calls the real self view, or what is uh, sometimes called the deep self view. This is obviously the view of Harry Frankfurt, uh, the most prominent proponent of this view. And Wolf says her view is not like that. Uh, this is the idea that one is morally responsible if and only if one is able to act from one's firmly held higher order desires, one's real self or one's deep self. And this is uh, the view of Harry Frankfurt. And Wolf presents a counterexample to this view. So she says, imagine a person is raised in an environment in which she had no chance of developing sound moral reason. Her environment just had completely warped moral reasoning. That's what she was taught from a child. She had no capacity to think any way else. She just couldn't, okay? Then she would be unable to reason according to the true and the good. And then she would not be morally responsible for any action. So she says, consider uh, maybe a suicidal bomber who's raised from a child uh, to have the beliefs that then prompt the person to become the suicidal bomber. And they just never had any opportunity to develop beliefs that are true and good when it comes to moral decisions. And so she says that person is not morally responsible, right? But they did act according to their real self or their deep self. They were deeply committed to being a suicidal bomber and, and, and fulfilling that, that goal in their life. And so acting from one's real self, Wolf argues, is not sufficient for moral responsibility. We shouldn't morally blame such a person. All right, to, to contrast her view with both of these now, in contrast to the autonomy view and the real self view, that's the AV and the RSV, right? The autonomy view and the real self view emphasize metaphysical concerns and they have little or no regard for concerns related to values. Now, uh, I'm confident that Frankfurt would object to that claim of his view. And I'm also confident that libertarians would object to that claim regarding their view, but we'll develop that in part two. So the reason view emphasizes a capacity for recognizing what is good and true, having this moral vision as Wolf calls it, this capacity to understand moral values and to act accordingly. And that she says is left out of the other views and it's so central, it's so important. It's amazing it seems that it was left out of these other views. So. The reason view implies that we 
a final implication here that we may not know whether a person is blameworthy uh, due to the fact that we cannot know whether the person has the ability to act according to the true and the good. That's something that from the outside, you just couldn't know for sure whether or not they actually had that ability. And so this creates a bit of skepticism about blaming somebody, morally speaking, because it's not clear whether or not the person could have done uh, what is true and what is good. And if they couldn't have, then they're not morally responsible for doing something wrong, for being blameworthy. Now, I've, I've mentioned already several times uh, to uh, consider part two, where we're going to look at more criticisms of Wolf's view.